After uh, Tuesday's incredible tragedy, Josh wrote to me and he said, you know, we really need to, we really need to talk about it. And I had the same sense. So in looking at uh, a huge number of scriptures, what we shared last week in prayer time really is the key concept. About Romans 12, 21. Do not be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. That's really the theme verse. And it represents a huge amount of scripture, just a huge amount. From Genesis all the way through to Revelation, the presence of evil in the human condition, the absence of goodness, the absence of the presence of God, a refusal to follow him, that's just on just about every single page. But meeting and exceeding the darkness and the evil is the grace and light revealed in Jesus Christ. So today, I didn't get my clicker, so click through for me. We're going to read Romans chapter 12, the whole chapter. Because I think that there is counsel through what Paul writes to the Romans. It was a little tiny church. It was not a massive cathedral. They didn't build that till the 6th century. It wasn't a formalized system. It wasn't a pope and archbishops and bishops and pastors. There wasn't any of that. It was common people. It's like you, like me. They lived in an incredibly violent world. They had virtually no rights. The Roman government and the Roman army could do whatever they wanted to do, and they did. In the reaches of the empire, violence against anyone from the Roman world suffered unspeakable harm. There was no recourse. They lived in a dangerous age. They lived in a violent age. They lived in a terrifying situation. And one of the realities that Paul deals with in the book of Romans is, why do you people treat each other the way you do? You take the enmity and the strife and the energy of the world and you turn it against each other in the body. So he's writing to a people who, who take what the world was doing, not just against Christians. I mean, it did happen against Christians, but it really happened against anybody of a disability or a difference or a, a change or an alternative. And then... The Christians were doing the same thing, and Paul writes about that. So we're going to read all of Romans chapter 12 and then look at particularly the Texas situation, Buffalo situation, and how in the world do you, do you begin to even think about it? What words can you use as opposed to I'm just, I have no idea. Romans chapter 12. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pa pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. For by the grace given to me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought to, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith that God has distributed to each of you. For as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function. So in Christ we, though many, form one body. And each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts, according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophecy, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it's serving, then serve. 
If it's teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Don't be proud, but be willing to associate with people of lower position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. We hear a news story. It's an event. It's an anecdote. It is one piece of information. And the challenge is that that one story has now captured the attention of the entire world. And our minds can begin to swirl around that event without being able to find our balance point or come up with an answer. For some, it is, I don't even watch the news anymore. I don't want anything to get through. I don't pay attention. I don't have a paper. I don't read anything on uh, internet. I'm just, I separate myself from everything. Others, I can't get enough of it. I want to know every detail and I'm absorbed. I'm fascinated. I'm transfixed. I'm drawn in and I can't get away. And then one story leads to another story. And then the analysis starts. And I know you're all hearing it, and it's all being said everywhere. This is, this is the way the world is. So I tried to think through what really is the core. How do we put into words? What is the essence of the problem? And then how do we answer that? It's a, it's a quip. It's a story. It's a bumper sticker to say, don't be overcome by evil. Overcome evil with good. Even if we just use that last phrase, overcome evil with good. That sounds nice. Somebody is weeping, crying in agony. Their lives are destroyed. You pat them on the back and say, overcome evil with good. Great. How? How do you overcome evil with good? What are you supposed to do? What are you supposed to say? How are you supposed to act? What can we here in Hilton do about any of these situations around the world? So that's really the challenge. And I'm not anticipating that in 20 minutes or 25 minutes I'll be able to give you absolutely every answer. I want to teach you how to think about it. Let me say... I want to teach you how I'm thinking about it. And you can either think that way or find a different way. But I offer it as, as a, a, an option to craft in yourself deeper, more solid thinking that's biblical and based on truth. I think there are three core issues that I see over and over and over in these situations. There's a list <clears throat> going around 
of 220 schools that have had mass shootings at them since 1991 or something like that. 30, 30 years, 31 years. It's very, very interesting because if you don't have enough evidence at once, just go back further in history and include more stories and then it becomes overwhelming information. It's really interesting to see that happening. So this long list and then some argue one way and some use the exact same evidence and argue the exact opposite based on that long list of 220 schools. Harden the schools. It's not the gun's fault. It is the gun's fault. It's crazy people. We need to pull them all out of society. We need to have greater resources. What we need is more police officers. What we need is more social workers. What we need is more psychologists. What we need to do is pull our kids out, stay away from it. And the same list produces all of those responses. There are three aspects. There's actually more than this, but it would be overwhelming to try and give you 30 points. There's no point in doing it because you won't remember it anyway. So I boiled it down to three that I think are the most important. In every one of these situations, as far as I can determine, one of the key issues is perceptions. The perception of what's going on. So we have an assault style rifle. And it seems in our minds that really is the core problem. It is a perception that that is what we're dealing with. In Judges chapter 7, there is a very interesting story about Gideon, who is fighting against the Canaanites, some, the Amalekites, somebody. There's somebody that Israel doesn't like. And what Gideon does is he amasses a gigantic army of 30,000-something warriors. And God says to him, Gideon, you got way too many people. They're going to be shooting each other in the back. I can't defeat your enemy with that kind of massive army. So you need to just send most of them home. This is very interesting in Judges chapter 7. By the way, this is not a biblical policy. It's an event. So Gideon says, hey, if anyone doesn't want to fight in this battle and you're scared and you just want to go home, then just go home. And 20,000 warriors went home, two-thirds of the army. 10,000 are left. Gideon comes to God and says, God, I've got 10,000 warriors. They're ready to fight. God says, you still have too many. If I'm going to deliver you and you're going to know it's me, I want you to get rid of most of them. Gideon says, how am I supposed to do that? Here's a real odd one. God says, take them down to the river. Everybody's thirsty. Have them get a drink. Watch them drink. The soldiers who put their face right down in the water and lap it up like a dog send them home. The ones who pick up the water in their hands as a cup and put it to their lips, keep them. So Gideon does that, and 9,700 9, put their face right down to the water and lap it up, and 300 don't. 300 pick the water up and suck it out of their hand. So Gideon says 9,700 of them home, and he's left with 300. That's kind of a stupid way to come up with an army. But there's a very interesting event that happens next. It almost sounds like what God was saying is, don't have anybody, just you. Go like the walls of Jericho. Blow a couple of trumpets, walk around a little bit, and I'll knock the walls down. But he doesn't do that. Gideon gives all 300 of them 
a ceramic pottery jar and a trumpet. And he teaches them how to blow a battle cry as if each one of them is leading a regiment. And then he says, go around the camp of our enemy, and on my signal, all of you throw the jars down at the same time, and all of you blow your trumpets and, and call to battle. So they do that, and the enemy believes there are hundreds of thousands that are ready to fight them. It's a perception issue. They're overwhelmed. They are terrified by their perceptions. There's not 300 regiments of troops. It's a sound of breaking pottery and some trumpet blasts, and the enemy get so confused and overwhelmed, they start attacking each other, and they rout out, and Gideon and 300 win the battle. Now, it's not God's advice of how do you defeat your enemy at work or in your neighborhood. It's the power of perception. And the perception that the enemy had was based on something they believed to be true, but it wasn't actually true. I picked that story out of quite a number of events throughout biblical history where either the enemies of God or the people of God believed something to be true, but it wasn't actually true. And then they acted on that perception, and the action was what was wrong. So I think one of the common factors is a perception that is causing those of us who are struggling to understand these days that becomes titled in what I call ever, never, always language. Everybody, always, no one it never, and we use extreme language. It's a perception. This happens all the time. Every school, it's, that's not true. It's a perception that's not true. Second one, I'm not going to belabor these factors. I want to look at the answers. The second one is isolation. There seems to be a very common theme that the perpetrators of these crimes are socially, in family, in education, in personal life, in work, they're isolated people. They're not connected in to society. They're not connected well into their families. Things are extremely difficult. There's much pain. There is, uh, there is brokenness. And they don't have an environment that provides for them identity and family. In 1 Kings 19, Elijah has been a mighty prophet. He has stood for God. He has accomplished great things. But as the story goes on, if we only see in Elijah, he called down fire out of heaven, God answered his prayer, he cleaned up all the false worship. Great stuff happened in his life. But then something broke. Something broke in Elijah. And Jezebel, the queen, is filled with rage that her system has been undone. So Jezebel and Ahab, Ahaz, her husband, says, Elijah, we're going to get you. We're going to get you somewhere. It's going to be in the market. It's going to be at your home. It's going to be when you're sleeping. But we're going to come for you, and we're going to get you. And Elijah is filled with fear. Now, part of it's perception. Why didn't he have the same grand faith in God that he had when he brought down the prophets of Baal? I don't know. I have no idea. Something broke in Elijah. And when Jezebel threatens him, he's overwhelmed with fear. So he runs. 
And as he is running, it begins to rain, and the pursuers get bogged down in the mud, and Elijah is able to escape. What Elijah does is he goes to the cave at Mamre, a place called Mamre. And he actually says, in 1 Kings 19, he says, I've had enough, Lord. I'm done. I'm exhausted. I've given everything. I don't have anything left. I'm, I'm finished. I quit. Don't ask me to do anything else. And God says to him, have you eaten anything? <laughs> You're so depressed, you forgot to eat? So God sends some ravens with some bread and they give him some nourishment. He's hiding in a cave. God says, let me show you who I am, Elijah. And there's this torrent and then there's this fire and then there's this huge wind. God wasn't in any of them. And then a still, small voice. And then Elijah says very, something very profound. He says, you know, God, I'm the only one left. I stood for you. I don't have anybody else around me. I did everything I could, and I've just run out. And God says to him, Elijah, I've got 7,000 other prophets that have not bowed the knee to Baal. You're not alone. Elijah says again, I'm the only one left, God. Nobody but me. There's this factor of isolation that is driving a person into a complete despair. We see that over and over in these situations. The, the characteristic of being a loner. The idea of being a loner is even if family members happen to be around, which in many cases they're not, the individuals have fallen into this hole, a dark, dark place where there's no society, there's no friendship. They may be online with some kind of a group, but there's no real connection into that at all. And isolation is a factor. The third one that I see in these situations is a sense of complete hopelessness, a lack of hope. My father committed suicide, as most of you know. And so as a pastor, I have been called into situations over the last 50 years. When I first went to RIT, students that just had gotten to the end of what they could deal with, at Roberts, when I was in Rochester working for Youth for Christ, when I was in Lexington, when I was in Yorkshire, even though they weren't people from my church congregation, I would be called in to deal with attempts for suicide, completion of suicide, families decimated by suicide. That was a very common thing. And over and over, people would say, this loved one that I had wasn't depressed, or they were depressed, or they were really, really angry, or they weren't angry or they were uh, uh, blank, they had no feelings at all, or they were filled with such feeling they didn't know what to do with it. But over and over, the one common aspect was hopelessness. Nothing I do is going to matter. I'm in a situation that I can't get out of. And it could be financial, it could be relational, it could be societal, it could be employment, whatever it is, the person who is collapsing has no hope for tomorrow. In Judges chapter 16, there is the story of Samson. And Samson, very interesting char character, he is filled with the Spirit of God, and God anoints him with power, and the evidence of his power is that he kept a Nazarite vow. That was an Old Testament activity to identify I am sold out for God. The Nazarite vow had several characteristics. One was you didn't drink any alcohol. For some reason, that was, that was very much a part of the, the issue. A second one was 
The Nazarite vow person never cut their hair, so their hair grew really long. And Samson had those characteristics, and then he's playing that out, and he's all got kind of stuff going on. Eventually, he falls for Delilah, and Delilah tricks him into revealing how he has such power with God. And one of the things he says is, I have this really long hair, and that is evidence of my commitment to God. So he falls asleep. She cuts off his hair. She calls in her own people. He now has no power. They gouge out his eyes. They strap him down, and they take him to uh, be on display in front of the Philistine people. That goes on for several months, and his hair grows back out. But his eyes aren't restored. And at the very end of his life, he says to the Philistines, place me between two pillars so that I can feel the pillars before you execute me. And so they do that. He's chained to two pillars. His hair has grown back out again. And Samson says to God, I've lost everything. I have nothing left. There is nothing for me, but give me one more chance to take as many people with me when I go. And he has the strength, pushes the pillars apart. The entire temple collapses, and thousands of people are killed at the same time. It's this sense of utter hopelessness. I'm not advocating that that's what God wanted him to do, but it's a fascinating event. He got to the end of his life, and he says, my life is worth nothing. There is no future for me. So I'm going to take as many people with me as I can when I go. And that seems to be, again, an issue that takes place over and over. These three factors, there's more. To be sure, there's more. This is not an adequate analysis of every situation that's happening in our, in our world. But perceptions of things that really are not true a sense of isolation and distance and broken relationships and a profound sense of hopelessness become characteristic of all these situations, all of them. So the question then is, what is the answer? Let's go to things that really matter. The, the answer to perceptions is perspective. And I, and I put up here, depth perspective. A perspective is understand what is actually happening in the totality. There is, a, I read a lot of uh, BBC and other uh, news sources about what's going on in Ukraine. In Ukraine, there is a... a constant attack against Mariupol, which has now fallen, but other cities, Kharkiv and some others that are around there. And what's interesting is the statements get made, everyone has left. All the buildings are destroyed. There's nothing left to fight for. And what some of these news sources are saying is, wait a minute, there were 400,000 people in Kharkiv there's still 100,000 that are there. Still 100,000. It's not that everyone's left. It's not that nobody's there. Everything hasn't been destroyed. Every school isn't under attack. The reality, when, when people say there's, there's no mercy and kindness in the world anymore, there is. It's quiet often. But everywhere you go, people are helping others. There is generosity, but you don't see it. The concept is, I perceive nothing but evil in the world, but there's incredible good in the world. It's still happening, even in the darkest places. The uh, stories that are told about this Uvelda, very, very tiny community in Texas, seems like the entire world has completely fallen apart, but the people that are there still love each other. And they're still going to church, and they're bringing their offerings and flowers, and they're hugging each other, and they're making something good. They're covering evil with an authentic good. So the challenge we have is understanding in perspective what our perceptions 
are telling us is supposed to be true. When Paul writes to the Romans opening this chapter, he says, let your minds be transformed. Let them be renewed. Understand what the will of God is, his perfect and complete and holy will. See things from God's perspective in this. How do we know how much we desperately need God in this culture? The reality is when everything's all going well, at least on the surface, we say we don't really need God. We can get away without God. But if some of these events happen, people are saying, wait a minute, we don't have enough. There is something missing in our world. And God agrees with that. Second, a bonding community. There, the reality of what Paul says in verses 4, 4 through 13 is the answer to isolation. You belong to each other. Our salvation is not one at a time. I get mine, and I don't care about anybody else. Salvation is a community. Our life in Jesus is all of us together. The way in which we're connected, to the degree to which we separate, to that degree we isolate, to the degree we come together and build community, we answer that question. The last one is where is hope? Hope is a concept is really meaningless for most people. It has to be practical. Where's my hand up and my hand out? Where's my connection? Where's my opportunity? And we as the people of God can begin continually creating chances to step up. There's a very interesting verse in 2 Samuel 14, verse 14, where, or, uh, 1 Samuel 14, 14, where the wise woman goes to King David who won't let his son come back, Absalom. He's rejected and he's blocked from the kingdom. And the wise woman says to David, God does not keep those who have been rejected out, but he finds a way to restore those who have been rejected. That's God's nature. That's the absolute essence of grace. Find a way. Build a connection. Step out. Call somebody. Extend a hand. Give a job opportunity. Even if it's just words of encouragement. I failed. I know you failed this time. But you're doing better. I know you can step forward. I believe in you. And to create the sense of community, not to be overwhelmed with failure and loss, but to step into that with faith and with hope. That becomes really the challenge of our day. That those who know God are not defeated by evil, which is the perceptions are correct. I'm withdrawing myself from the situation, and I really have no hope. The answer to that is what we bring to this world. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, these are incredibly difficult days. It is not enough for us to sing some songs and feel good. It is really not our calling to just wait for the end of the world and Jesus to come back and fix everything, but to step into this moment and to bring a greater understanding of truth, a confidence in community, and a hope that is beyond mere words but it's real, substantial. Make us people of 
Romans 12, 21. That we are overcomers. We overcome evil with what is good. In Jesus' name we pray.